to today. Can, and, and I want you to understand something that, man, having a biblical worldview isn't the easiest thing to do today. But losing a biblical worldview is absolutely detrimental. And by that, I mean viewing life, viewing circumstance, viewing situations, viewing the climate of our world, viewing everything that we see through the lens of Scripture rather than through the lens of ourselves and trying to apply Scripture to it. Viewing the lens through, viewing through the lens of Scripture is what a biblical worldview is. It's not just your ability to quote scripture. It's not just your ability to, to break down scripture and talk the word, which I love to do. But it's being able to take the world and filter it through scripture so that you walk victoriously 100% of the time. And so I want to share with you Mission Restore. And you're going you're gonna to understand where we're, we're going with this. I saw an interesting article that I didn't read, but the title of the article was alarming. The article thread said this. Barring any limiting event such as war or economic depression, if the pace at which Christians, listen, at which Christians abandon their faith. He didn't say at the rate at which the world gets seedier and darker. He said the rate at which the Christians abandon their faith before the age of 30. If it is to accelerate beyond its current pace, the sad thing is, is there is a pace. America could no longer be a majority Christian nation by as nearly as 2045. At the current rate of Christians abandoning didn't say leaving, didn't say ch ch changing, it said abandoning their faith. We said it last week, jumping ship. At the rate at which it is going right now, 2045, uh, that's the, everybody's like, oh, now that's, you know, that's what, 22 years from now? We've got time. But if anything else accelerates the rate of their abandonment by, within... 20 years, 20, just a few years over 20, we could see ourselves as a purely secular nation. That's a problem. That's a problem. Then I also read another article written by Dr. Michael Brown of Pensacola Revival fame. Some of you may have heard of Michael Brown's books that he wrote. The title of this article is, When Masculine Christianity Becomes Unhealthy, Even Dangerous. And when I got to the comments, I read some of them. Now understand that what he's talking about is there's a difference between militant Christianity and ma masculine Christianity. Masculine Christianity is ultimately what we prayed for today, for men to rise up and be men of God. That's a good thing. It's when there is this move to... to a militant Christianity in which our rights as a citizen supersedes our biblical worldview. I just want, I want you to hear what all he was saying. He said, this is dangerous. And as I was reading the, the, uh, the comments, because, man, I love to go to the comments and just to see how crazy people are, it became clear that this article stirred up the debate of feminism versus manhood. And the discussion of toxic womanhood versus toxic manhood. And to put us all to shame, it wasn't worldly people speaking. It was Bible-thumping, Bible-believing Christians who were doing all of the arguing. The battle of the sexes was going on in this article that a man was writing as a warning Stop getting so far outside the bounds of what a biblical worldview is supposed to present to the world. Huh. In fact, the article in the comments got so close to, to I, I wanted to get on there, you know me, I, I wanted to put my two cents in and I did not. I had self-control, I practiced spiritual gifts and fruits. 
uh, in this one. But the, there, there was even a thread within this, the comments on whether or not Dr. Michael Brown, a, a full of the Holy Spirit, messianic Jewish man who, uh, who loves the Lord with all of his heart and was an instrumental part of, of the leadership within the, the movement at, at Brownsville Revival all of those 20 plus, 30 plus years ago. And there was this argument on whether or not this author drank the Kool-Aid of wokeness. And became a self-fulfilling negative prophecy because all of a sudden, militant Christianity began to take over what was supposed to be a healthy discussion of men being men of God. Hmm. It was sad. Not, a, not, not only that, but this, uh, after reading that, and, and it became quite clear that the church is missing something significant. Let me say that again. The church is missing something significant. No, let me say that again. The church is missing something significant. We've lost a bit of ourselves. We've lost something that made us so uh, attractive to the world. But then I read this post from a man I follow on Facebook and, and, and the men all received a book from him on Father's Day. The man's name is Neil Kennedy. Listen to what he said. This was a prophetic word and I don't want you to get all ruffled when I say this. It was a prophetic word on sanctuary cities. September 13th, this was this last week. During worship in Joliet, Illinois at First Assembly, I heard the Spirit say, I am selecting sanctuary cities around the world in a culture of wickedness and violence. Now, this is a conversation he was having. I said, but Lord, sanctuary city is a political term of the left. No, the Holy Spirit said, it is my term. I own the sanctuary. Y'all missed that one. Then I saw cities, large cities, New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and others were desolate, dystopian, and gray, people fleeing the evil. Then I saw other cities, San Diego, Sao Paulo, Nashville, Springfield, Santiago, Tulsa, Huntsville. Notice he's kind of all over the spectrum of size and, and shape. And of course, he even mentions Joliet here, many, many others, too numerous to even talk about. Then the Spirit said, I have made these sanctuary cities places of refuge, renewal, restoration, revival, and resurrection. People will come to these cities and find my spirit in churches. Not all churches, but those gathering of believers that desire the power and presence of the spiritual gifts, the manifestations and operations, salvation, healings, miracles will be the norm. It became clear that, we're miss that we are missing something and what we need to get back is something so important to ourselves and to those who are around us to be the influence that we must be in these last days. Not only do we need to find it and reacquire it, but the Bible says it must be restored. Mission restore. Here's what we need. We need the joy of salvation. We need the joy of salvation. As I was reading these articles and thinking and processing, and, and this was before, uh, before I even read these articles and various things, I had already, uh, by about Wednesday morning, had this scripture that was just burning inside of my heart, and I was like, okay, God, where are we going with this? And, and then it just became apparent the, the further into the week that we got, and I realized that the church, in order to fulfill these prophecies, of being a sanctuary city, a refuge, a place where people can be revived, where hungry people desiring the power and presence of God, where miracles and a, and a culture of miracles is established, where there is just the clear-cut move of God, we've got to actually not just be lumps on a log sitting there depressed. Now, fortunately for you, I have... No notes. No bullet points, I should say. I have notes, so I have direction. But no points, you guys are. This, this is, here's your point. There it is, point one, point two, three, four, five, and eternal. We need the joy of salvation. 
in order to be a sanctuary city, a place of hungry people, in order for this place to be filled with hungry people, lost and found, we need to restore the joy of salvation. So turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 51. We're going to read the whole psalm. The whole psalm. 51, starting in verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David. Actually, yeah, this, okay, this is in verse 1. Good, I'm glad. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Doesn't it sound like hungry people? Restore to me, verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, listen, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Could it be that conversion and discipleship is failing in the church because we've lost the joy of our salvation? Notice, restore to me. And I will teach transgressors your ways. Huh? Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Isn't that interesting? All facets of church. You know, if joy of salvation was present in our lives, we wouldn't have to light you up every week. You wouldn't need the Daniels. To grab the microphone and say, come on somebody. Come on somebody. I want you to hear this. This is not, uh, th- this is yes, a slap. But at the same time, by the end of this, I want this to be a shout. Because we need joy. We need joy. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good design in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. First notice this psalm is the occasion, and the occasion in which it was written is adultery committed by David. Understand this, the devil didn't make him do it. David chose. David chose to commit adultery with Bathsheba and take a wife and make her his wife, which in the Hebrew literally means that he took her special position of belonging and made her common. It would seem to me that in many ways we have done this with salvation. We have taken the special position of belonging and made it an afterthought. Do you remember the the song, If if You're Happy and You Know It, Clap Your Hands? Then we would always put that verse, If You're Saved and You Know It, Shout Amen. And we go, Amen! We do it as children. Do that with adults and they're like, Amen. Why? Because saved is no longer the point. It's an afterthought. 
But saved is supposed to be the foundation which influences everything about us. If you're saved, that's, that's awesome. Uh, 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 Leonard Ravenhill would, a, would ask you the question, if you were to say, I'm saved, he would say, saved from what? What are you saved from? Because if you are saved from something, give me something that, so that I know that you're rejoicing about seeing, being saved from something, not just being saved. You see, when we relegated it to just understanding that now we hold a, 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 a title of being saved, we turn it into an afterthought. And we stop celebrating it. The Bible says all of heaven rejoices when one of these gets saved. And we go, so precious. Welcome to the club. Six weeks later, they're as dead as the rest of everyone else. Oh, pastor, why are you saying this? Because if we don't understand how low we've gotten, we can't get excited about how high we can go. See, it's amazing to me that David penned this psalm immediately after his encounter with Nathan the prophet. It's very simple. And you know I love to tell stories, so I'm going to try and tell it and yet read it off at the same time. Nathan approaches David telling him of an atrocity that has happened under his watch. That there is a man who has an abundance of sheep living next door to another man who has only one. And the man with abundance had a guest. And instead of choosing from his flock, he decided to take the one lamb that was most precious and live next door. David, now that's the short Reader's Digest version. David is is angry and he begins to pronounce this sentence of death. He says, this man is surely going to pay for his insolence. Take me to the man. Where am I going to, who do I have to go and punish? Because this is unheard of. This shall not stand. This cannot happen again in all of Israel. This is wrong. And Nathan says, you are the man. Prophet then flips the script on David, telling him he's the man. David realizes the error of his ways, and the prophet replies to him, this is, this is what is so awesome, and this is context for you. Nathan replies to David after David has said, I have sinned, I've sinned, I, I, oh my God, I have done wrong. His eyes are opened, and he says this, and this is so powerful, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. This becomes the backstory of David's psalm. And so the focus of, the, of this passage of scripture in Psalm 51 is, is really, it is verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. We're just going to focus on restore to me the joy of your salvation. David has written this as an expression of hope, but it is, a, it is more than that. You see, we've got we to understand and, and notice here that David doesn't ask for salvation to be restored. Stop there for a second. Because I need you to understand that just because you fail doesn't mean that salvation is lost. Okay, understand that. Now, you can walk away from salvation if you want to. But just because you have messed up in life, just because you've made some mistakes, does not mean that salvation is, is, is taken away from you or is now dead inside of you and that that needs to be restored. What David asks, he doesn't ask for salvation to be restored. He says, restore the joy of salvation, of, of, of your salvation. And so we've got to understand this, this concept of joy. What does joy really mean? Listen, joy is not just standing ovations at something that pleases you. Hmm. David realized that his choices he had made were a result of temptation, to be certain, but more so because obviously he had forgotten the joy of having a saved relationship with God. See, David is confessing to us, he's giving us the secret. Why is it that he fell into sin? Why did he fall into that temptation? Why did he go down that road when everything was telling him, don't do it? Why did he do those things? Well, pastor, because the Bible says that in the days when kings would go out to war, David was at home. Well, I know that. And anybody can, can grab that in the passage and say, well, he just wasn't being kingly. No, it wasn't that he wasn't being kingly. 
he stopped celebrating sonship. No, don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. It wasn't because he just failed in the kingly responsibility. It's that he lost sight of his sonship yeah. with the father. He lost sight of the importance of his being saved and in a saved relationship with God. So restore to me the joy of salvation. See, when people begin to uh, uh, use salvation as an afterthought, then the life that they live and the sin they commit becomes just a part of living the Christian life. It becomes a part of, well, uh, of the day-to-day, the understanding, this is where God knows my heart comes from. This is where the whitewashing of sin and the tampering with Scripture to cover my sinfulness and to cover my, my, my error so that I feel justified in saying, I praise you, Lord, on Sunday and doing whatever I feel like doing on Monday. I know I'm, better, I'm preaching better than y'all are talking. Maybe I'm eating your cereal with you. But the truth is, The joy of salvation becomes a consistency in our lives so that we don't have to have firecracker altar times once every two months. Once every time we feel like God has come into the place and tickles the back of our hair. It becomes a consistent level of worship. It becomes a consistent expectation. Worship becomes elevated. Prayer becomes elevated. Praise becomes elevated. Everything changes when the joy of salvation has been restored in our lives. This word joy is defined as jubilation. That's awesome. Gladness, emotional delight. But it also means this, to shout in exultation. It's not just an act of response. It is a state of being. See, because we have created salvation as an afterthought, we just tell, yes, I'm saved, and then we go, oh, but in this world you shall find trials of many different kinds. We succumb to the pressures of the trial more than embracing the victory of sonship over that trial. So all of a sudden our shout becomes an oh me. It becomes an oh my. It becomes a a response, a reaction to the situation. And then we do things like some days I just don't feel saved. Or some days I just act like I'm not. I want you to understand, I I get the humanity of that argument. And I get that, yes, we don't have perfection, that that we don't always walk perfectly. And I get that Jesus is the only perfect. But I also know that the Bible does not stop at just saying Jesus in your heart. It says image of Jesus. It pushes us into the image of Jesus. We are conforming to Him. The only conformity that is allowable in the Christian walk is to look more and more like Jesus every day. And from what I have read and understand about Jesus, He never fell into sin. He was tempted as we all are. But he did not fall into sin, which means at some point we've got to understand that temptation is not sin. But choosing to respond to temptation is what creates sin. Because I tell you what, I am tempted to yell at all kinds of people every day. And I'm thankful that I have zero stickers advertising the church or who I am. On the back of my car. Because there are days that I want to chew the world out. There are days I want to, that that in my mind, I hear the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other one going, just say what you feel. No. Why? Because because I got to listen to this voice over here. No, because Jesus is constantly saying, what did I do? What did I do? How did I respond to naysayers? How did I respond to negative situations? How did I respond to temptation? How did I respond to those things? I said, get behind me, Satan. I I, I won't go there. I'm not going to go there. And I trusted on this power of the spirit that was inside of me. Understand, Jesus had the power of the spirit, not just because he was Jesus, but because he had to live life as a man. 
And if, God, if Jesus saw fit to be a spirit-filled individual walking the earth, then, be, then maybe just maybe being a, a person full of the Spirit of God is an important thing in the church and in the world. So joy is a shout. It's, it's more than a response. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's a thankfulness. It's a thanksgiving because I am a life that was saved. I am. I was on my way to hell, but you reached into the pit and you pulled me out, and you've cleaned me off, and you've set me at the heaven, at the right hand of the Father. You've seated me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's a position that we have been given. But then he says it's not just for us to understand joy. It's now this. It's also this understanding salvation, and not just any salvation, but it's your salvation notice he didn't say restore unto me the joy of my salvation he says restore to me the joy of your salvation which means he does not take ownership of the salvation it belongs to the father it belongs to the father it's his salvation this means it is his process of salvation I'm going to kick this off with just a, just, a, just a small bit of information. In the Old Testament, salvation was brought about through the blood sacrifice of animals. Not just a sin offering to cover for sin, but also the burnt offering is a sign of worship and adoration to God that was required morning and evening. For David, the concept of salvation was more likened to physical deliverance rather than uh, from sin, though that was a part of it. His understanding meant that as long as he was walking in and understanding of the law and the worshipful nature of the sacrificial system, God would bring deliverance from enemies. And we see that in his lifestyle, the way that he lived primarily, with the exception of this moment, uh, he lived for the word of God. He lived for the Lord. And he understood that his sacrifice, the, it, engaging in sacrifice, engaging in offering the, the burnt offerings, engaging in every form and aspect of worship as was required in the law, it didn't just bring relationship with, with God, but it brought a physical deliverance. And so when David talks about, a, about salvation, many times he's not talking about Jesus living in our heart. He's talking about his concept of salvation, which is God's got my back at all times. And every enemy gets defeated because I'm on God's side, not the Lord is on my side. I'm on his side. And in covenant with God, your enemies become my enemies. And since God's enemies are already defeated, he just decides to let his defeated enemies become your defeated enemies. Because in the process of covenant, you share those things and you become one with, your, with the God that you serve and the God that you worship. You become in a one relationship with him. And so all things that he has, knows, and does is all things you have, know, and can do. That doesn't make you God. But it makes you his kid. With all of the rights and privileges of sonship. You can actually say my daddy is bigger than your daddy. <laughs> For David victory was over enemies he could see and battle against. Now understand this. If David rejoiced in what was temporary. I'm about to say that again. If David rejoiced in what was temporary, how much more joy can we have in what is eternally accomplished through Jesus? If David celebrated and danced before the Lord in a temporary sacrificial system that did nothing to clean the inside of him. If David was willing to practically dance naked in front of everyone and be as undignified as possible in worshiping in a, in a system that was temporary until the eternal through Jesus was going to arrive. If David was crazy enough to dance... In what was temporary. Why are we so afraid to dance. In what is eternal. 
Why are we so afraid to rejoice in what is eternal? Why are we so afraid to be in that eternal perspective with him and to walk in a continuous joy? Because, ladies and gentlemen, yes, God can set you free from death. From, from physical enemies. God can come into your physical situation and change it. In a minute, we've seen him do it. We have testimony over the last 20 years of people whose lives have been changed, how God showed up in crisis moments in their lives and delivered them from physical situations that were just mind-boggling what God can do. And, and, and if we only stop there... then we're like half a barrel on a, do- on a double barrel shotgun. We're missing the bigger, more important part. Because yes, God can deliver you from all of those physical things, but he delivered you, what you d- from what you could not deliver yourself. That's right. That's right. That's right. He delivered you from sin. You can't deliver yourself from sin. He delivered you from death. You can't deliver yourself from death. I don't care how many cryogenic cryogenic clinics you go to to freeze yourself till 2095 so that you can come back and see what what situations are like back then. I I don't care how much the doctors and all of the, the things that they are capable of doing, brilliant things. Who knew that progress could peak above a, a, a fake heart? That man could design a heart that will function in a human body. Well, that used to be the big thing right back, back in the day. Well, when I was growing up in the weekly reader that we would get. Read about those nice little stories of man's ability to create these things. And God can do significantly more. God can, God can heal to the utter most we sing that song when I think about the Lord who saved me, who filled me with the Holy Ghost and healed me to my uttermost. It wasn't just a, a healing physical, it was a cleansing and a healing spiritual that came on the inside of you through the blood of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, if David got all pumped up and excited and in a revival spirit for something that he even prophesied was temporary... Why are we not crazy, insane, on fire for God through the salvation that we have received that is eternal? Maybe it's just too convicting for us. We got to get to this understanding of salvation. Restoring salvation. Salvation in the Hebrew, listen, is the root word for yesha. From which we get, now, and, and this is what is crazy. David's literal translation is restore to me the exultant shout of your Yesha. Yesha is the root word from which we get the name Yeshua. Restore to me. The exultant shout of your Jesus. Folks, it begins and ends with Jesus. It begins and ends with Jesus. It begins and ends with Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is, he is, he is. And if we don't understand that what Jesus has done, listen, what Jesus has done for you is more important than any advancement you could have in the church. It's more important than the fan base that you get on your social media when you post good Christian memes. It's more important than any of those things that we've tried to do in the temporary world. I don't intend to have a funeral, ladies and gentlemen. I intend to have a resurrection. Understand, it comes back to Jesus. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do for you? He he saved me. From what? He saved me from sin. Sin which does what? Destroys. Okay, yeah, what else does it do? Sin, it destroys. Well, yeah, what else does sin do? Well, it, it destroys. That's all you know. No, sin condemns you to hell 
for all eternity. It doesn't just destroy. It condemns to hell for all eternity. What did Jesus do? He defeated the clutches of sin in my life. Which means what? It means that sin can't drag you down into hell anymore. It means that sin no longer has a hold on you. It means that you are now free. You once had to walk around with the weight on your shoulder that you were always connected to sin. You were always connected to that lifestyle, that prone humanity that we so love to throw around as if it's an excuse for doing things that we know we shouldn't do, but we choose to do it anyway. I'm only human. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you are a new creation in Christ Old things, in other words, your humanity has to surrender to the eternity of Jesus that has been placed on the inside of you. If you can't get excited about being an overcomer, listen, if you can't get excited about walking into a battle having already won, there is, I, I don't understand. Sin has been defeated in your life and yet you hold on to a 30 year battle with it. Well, pastor, that's very simple-minded of you. No, it's not. Because I'm not, I'm not trying to take away that you mess up. I'm not trying to get everybody to walk on water today. But I want you to know there's a difference between going into a battle with the mindset of a loser and going into the battle with the mindset that you're already the champion. There's a difference in the way you prepare for battle when you're a loser versus when you prepare for battle when you know you're the champion already. There's a difference in the way that you carry yourself. We walk around with, with, with uh, uh, like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football that Lucy holds on to. <laughs> Reluctantly, knowing she's going to move the ball because she enjoys watching you fall on your back. And we go into our into we go into temptation, we go into life, we go into all of these things regarding life as Lucy holding a ball and we just pray, Lucy, have mercy on me. Hold the ball so I can at least kick it and get a victory. When what Jesus did in you is so that you don't even approach Lucy with the ball because you're better than that. Now, don't miss that. Jesus has made you better than having to play the game the enemy puts in front of you. And if we don't understand the joy of salvation, then we are always going to play the game with Lucy. Uh, There's like four of us that are getting it today. And I, I don't... Listen, church, that's just not my style. That's just not my way of doing things. I get that. Okay. But if you got a life in you, you need to show that you got some life in you. I've never seen a dead person claim themselves alive unless it was Monty Python. Listen, can I say this? And, and I, I want you to understand from the, from the beginning before I say this. I love the move of the Spirit of God. Love it. I love it when, uh, when others are compelled to grab the mic and the, and the five-fold ministry and the manifestation of the gifts happens not just through the pulpit, but through the pew. Because that's church. That's when God begins to really show himself because he doesn't, he doesn't need me to do it all. Because if I have to do it all, it's just a show. But when he begins to walk in amongst the people and he begins to use you and he begins to express himself through the giftedness that he's put inside of you, man, that's awesome. So I want you to know I love the move of the Spirit of God. But ladies and gentlemen, if we are more excited about the Spirit of God moving in the church than we are about our salvation, we've lost the plot. 
when my salvation and the joy of my salvation is what should bring me to the house of God to worship. It should bring me through these doors with an expectation that what is God going to do because I already know what he's done and I just can't wait to see what's the next thing he is that's going to do because I'm so stirred and excited about what he's already done in my life. You see, when excited people walk into a church, an excited God begins to move. But God will play down to where we are. So if we don't expect him to move, he won't. If we're not excited about our salvation, he won't be either. He may be the one that has offered it. But I, I, I did it this, I, I say it this way. Listen, I love my kids. I love my son. I love that they were involved in athletics. But it, when it came to the place of them having a coach that was not me, it then became the want to that was in them. Because I couldn't live through them. I couldn't put the work in for them unless I was going to be the one that was going to play. And the high schools weren't asking me, so, okay. <laughs> we could have at least gone to state at least one of these years that I've been around. No, I'm kidding. But I, I, I would talk to them. Guys, how's it going? Oh, you know. Well, son, listen, if you want it that bad, go after it. If it's already available, why aren't you going after it? If it's sitting there before you, why aren't you excited about that opportunity? Why aren't you just embracing it as mine and working like it's yours and living like it's already yours? Why aren't you doing that? It's like we're, tri we're still trying to earn salvation, ladies and gentlemen. We, we've been... We've had the title of saved for 50 years, but we're still trying to earn that we are saved. That's wrong. You're saved from sin. It happened when you declared Jesus is Lord. Not waiting for the rapture so that you can say it. Oh. My heart is stirred because I'm, I'm thinking... Uh, Neil Kennedy didn't mention Mount Pleasant, but he implied it. Because he said many more. So whether he really meant us or not, I'm taking many more as yes. I'm going to receive it by faith. I want to be a sanctuary city. I want to be a place where the house of God rules and reigns. I want to be a place where people come to hear the word of the Lord, to see God move, for lives to be changed. I want to see all of that happen. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to happen if the people that already are here, if the team that's already won doesn't look like they've won. We've got to get to the place where we start living in the victory we already have so that we can start walking in the victory that is coming. We've got to start living in the victory that we have so that when we minister to others, they begin to embrace the grace we've received so that as, he, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, so that the thanksgiving can raise more and more to the glory of God the Father. We, we, we live in this world, yes, but we are not of this world. Do you not understand what that means? That is not just an old-fashioned holiness quotation for the churches that are out in the country that have separated themselves from all society, living, uh, living on the land and doing all of those things. Paul says you're in the world, but you're not of the world. He means you live in this place, but you don't have to abide by what everybody else abides by. You live in the world, but that doesn't mean that you have to surrender to the powers of the world. You live in the world, but you've already defeated the authorities that are in this present world. You live in this world, but you are helping pull people out of this world. Yeah. It's a heavy message, but I can... And, and, and I know it is. And it's, it seems like a downer after everything that happened. But I promise you it's not. Because what I'm talking about is the foundation for consistency in everything that just happened. So I'm asking you this morning, church. You get to choose. 
You get to choose the direction of the church. You get to choose the direction of where we're going to go from this day forward. You get to choose the atmosphere. You get to choose all of those things. You get to choose it. I mean, that seems to be what has been going on. Uh, If we're going to pray in the Spirit and be people of the Spirit, then you get to choose to be a person of the Spirit or not be a person of the Spirit. If you're going to be a man of God or a woman of God, then you get to choose to be a man of God or a woman of God. But the one thing that you can't do in any of those is try to walk around what Jesus has done for you. Now, I've got to be honest with you, church. We can choose the same old, same old where we all get gussied up and we come to church and we have three songs and we have the every two months we have a good tickle of the Holy Ghost and it just becomes wonderful and, and, and we talk about church for the next week and then we come back the next week and we compare last service to this one and wonder where God went. Because we've forgotten that this is this, me and you sitting in the chairs. We are God's house. And in reality, God didn't leave his house. We left his. But if we choose to be in the ordinary, if we choose to then then continue the status quo of, of declaring salvation, but living like you don't have it. And yes, I'm throwing a gauntlet down because my goodness, I'm, I, I side with, with Daniel. I am sick and tired of normal. Sick and tired of normal. I'm sick and tired of, of, of every year people struggling with the same things because they've forgotten who they are in Christ. I'm, I, I'm tired. Uh, and this is, th- this is me speaking probably for more than just myself. And, and, but I'm, I'm speaking to you because I hear it on a, day, on a weekly basis. I hear it reports from other pastors in the area. I hear it. So it's not just a this church kind of thing. It's an every church kind of thing. But the frustration is, is ladies and gentlemen, we're either going to be saved and joy in that salvation... Or we're going to try to blend and lock ourselves up to what's going on in the world and base our happiness on what's going on in the world and base our victory on what's going on in the world and whether we have laws written in our favor or laws taken away that don't favor us anymore or whether or not we have a a, a good voice or a a strong voice or or we're the most powerful entity at the polls or, or whatever it is. Ladies and gentlemen, none of that matters if the church quits seeing people saved. The last time I checked, saved people save people. Just like hurt people hurt people. Save people will save people. And people who are joyous about their salvation will attract a whole lot more people than those who just abide by being saved. So yes, I want to frustrate you with the words that I've said today. Because I'm wanting to stir you up into a place where you decide I'm going to be joyful because of what he has done for me. I don't want to live like I did yesterday, church. I don't want to live like I did a year ago. I don't want to have the same appreciation for what God did uh, all those years ago when I asked, when, when I declared him as the Lord of my life and said, Jesus, come into my heart. Listen, I didn't realize what he had done in me. And it has taken me reading scripture and studying. And you've seen it. You, you, you understand you've seen it in me. You've seen me talk, talk about reading your Bible and digging into the word and doing all. It has taken probably in the last three to four years for me to truly appreciate what Jesus has done for me. Well, what are you saying, Pastor? Are you saying that you just kind of went through the motions for the 16 years ahead before this? Yeah. I was performing duties instead of being a son. I was choosing to be respected by title. Of 
being honored as a son. I was choosing what makes me happy rather than being joyful. It's the craziest thing. Why do we need to get excited? Because there's more to it. It's not just salvation from sin. It's not just that, that, that. but the word in the Greek for salvation, while it also does, while it means salvation from sin, it is the same word that is used for snatching away. The joy of salvation is not just that he has saved you. The joy of salvation is all that is, is not just that you have defeated death. The joy of salvation is the fact that Jesus is coming very, very soon. And he is going to catch his bride away. And we are going to be forever with the one who has saved us. And listen, I, 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 may, many of you may have seen it, but I, I have to share this with you so that you understand uh, what's, what's going on in the world. It, w- I, it would be wrong of me to not share this, but I saw a post, and you can actually verify it on, on YouTube. I actually have the, the video of it. Just Friday, Thursday or Friday afternoon. Well, it would be, it would be the next day. Okay, so Friday afternoon I saw this post, a real-time post. Five. Purebred red heifers arrived in Israel. Five. Pure bread red heifers arrived in Israel. And there was a huge celebration because, see, the red heifer is the required beast for the sin offering of the nation. It's the required beast for the burnt offering of the nation of Israel. Which five, that doesn't sound like a lot, but these are five, probably four females and one male, so they breed. This is significant because in Israel it means they're gearing. They're fixing to build the third temple. Fixing to build it. Which some reports have said that they could build it 20 times over. They have the money stored. They've just been waiting for the opportunity. Five red heifers show up. And, and you're like, well, what's, what's the red heifer? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so what is the significance of the red heifer? Oh, my gosh. I, I can't wait to share this with you. It's actually, it's called, uh, it's literally called the right of the red cow. The R-I-T-E of the red cow. Okay, this is what it says. It was found among the priestly regulations of the Pentateuch and is unique in the Old Testament. The legislation that you find in Numbers chapter 19, verses 2 through 10, presented in terms of a revelation to Moses and Aaron, prescribes that the Israelites, Israelites provide a perfect, unblemished red cow, which has not been agriculturally worked. In other words, these cows can't have plowed the field. Okay, they cannot, they, they are super special above all other cows. This isn't like the in, the, 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 uh, in India where they're considered gods. No, they are special for sacrifice. Okay, They cannot have been agriculturally worked. According to, to Numbers, the cow is given to Eliezer, a priest, and Aaron's son, who is next in line to become high priest, who takes it outside the camp. Now listen, an anonymous slaughterer kills the animal under Eliezer's supervision. Eliezer then takes some of the blood and sprinkles it seven times in the direction of the front of the tent of meeting. An anonymous person, probably the same person who did the slaughtering, then burns the entire cow under Eliezer's supervision. When this is being done, the priest throws cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet thread into the fire. Finally, a pure person... Someone other than the priest, but most likely uh, uh, someone uh, that is designated, and the slaughterer burner, since the, the since the uh, since these are now impure, gather the resulting ashes and store them in a pure place outside the camp. This is this is the rite of the red cow. And didn't it sound awfully familiar? You see, we have. The perfect sacrifice. Jesus. The spotless one. 
who was taken outside the city. And an unknown person doesn't mean that they were simply a stranger. It meant that they were not recognized as a part of Israel. They weren't, well, they weren't known. Jesus is taken out of the city. He's carrying a cross. He gets to the place of the skull, which at that time is outside of the city. And he there is killed by an unknown slaughterer under the supervision of the high priest. Who then, when Jesus dies, allows another person, not the high priest and not the slaughterer, to take his remains and put him in a pure place, undefiled, outside the city. We call that the tomb. Just so you know, the tomb had never been used. It was, by all intents, pure. It's placed in there for safekeeping. Here's the cool thing. Israel, the first thing they're going to do when the sacrifices begin to be reinstated is they're going to take the rite of the red cow and they're going to offer outside the city what they believe is the consecrating sacrifice that reconnects them to the Father. And they're going to have this for a little while. And then all of a sudden, the Bible tells us, according, according to the book of Revelation, that about three and a half years in to this wondrous time of revival and bloodshed, it's just all of a sudden there will be a man of lawlessness who will come in and say, stop. And there will be some fighting. There will be some trouble. There will, because now their, 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 their rights have been stopped. And in their moment of desperation, when they get to a place of hopelessness, because now their rights, their sacrifices have been taken away, Jesus is going to step down out of the clouds. The Bible says he's going to put his foot on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to put another foot on a mountain across. Symbolically, ultimately, this is the same thing as the two mountains that are mentioned in Deuteronomy where they read the blessings and the cursings. The blessings for obedience and the cursings for disobedience. Jesus is going to step down, symbolically placing his authority on both mountains, expressing to the world, I've covered it all. And then, we shall be with him. We used to sing that song, uh, 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 We Will Ride. Riding alongside Jesus, participating in the deliverance of Israel, watching Jesus show himself as the absolute Messiah that Israel has needed their whole life. They're so, they're, they're, the reason I'm so excited that these heifers have shown up to Israel didn't sound right coming out of my mouth, but the reason I'm so excited for this is because this means that Jesus is about to reveal himself, not to the world, to Israel. And when Jesus reveals himself to Israel, all bets are off. And here's the thing, I can't wait for that day. I'm excited for that day. And guess what? I get to be ringside. And you know who paid the ticket? Jesus did. He has invited me to this celebration of his Messiahship by embracing what he has done in my life. And I can be full of joy knowing that, yes, sin has been defeated. Yes, death has been defeated. And yes, eternity has, has been resurrected inside of me. And the participation of being next to Jesus side by side with the one who has saved me. Come on, y'all. Everything that you have ever gone through so that you can look at the glory of Jesus and go, it really was worth it all. It really was worth it all, wasn't it? The glory of Jesus is so much greater than the glory 
that I have right now. The glory which will be revealed in me is going to be so much more powerful when I see Jesus face to face. I can't wait to see him. Oh, well, pastor, you don't talk like you can't wait to see him. I can't wait to see him. Just because I know there's work to be done doesn't mean that I can't wait to see him. But it should be a drive to want to work faster. Isn't it funny? When you know that the, when you know someone special is going to arrive, you clean your house. I promise you, when, when we do Christmas with the pastors... You clean the house. Why? Because all of you special people are coming over. And we've got to have the house clean so that y'all can make messes and we can clean it up after that. <laughs> but you clean your house in the expectation that you're going to arrive. And guess what? You make sure, that, and we do our best, but, you know, cooking has, does one of those things to us. It just kind of frustrates. But we, we, we cook and, and we're, oh, I can't, we don't have any time. And then it's like, okay, wait a minute. It's worth it when everybody comes over and they eat all of it so that I don't gain 100 pounds eating the leftovers, y'all. So, uh, but, you know, so we're having celery and that's it. Celery and squeeze cheese. That's all we're going to have this year at Christmas with the pastor. So that, uh, so it's easy for us to not eat it afterward. But but the thing is, is we clean our house and we get ourselves prepared and we're so excited about it and we can't wait to see you and we build this whole preparation up and we've done everything that we can possibly do and then we stay in that frame of mind waiting for the first person to come through the door. But it seems like with Jesus, it's like, well, we know Jesus is coming and we keep hearing the arguments that he's coming and we keep seeing the signs. So we've gotten really cold towards all of this prophecy watcher stuff. Everybody's talking about Jesus is coming and everybody starts talking about the signs and Jesus still hasn't shown up. He's been they've been talking signs since Paul. Jesus still hasn't shown up. That's been 2,000 years. He's probably not going to show up until every one of us is dead and these kids are all married running the country or maybe their kids are married and running the country. Who knows? We don't know when Jesus is going to return. But until then, we're just going to wish that our lives could be better here on earth through human means. Instead of walking confidently.